Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you, sir. With immense pleasure, I would like to invite Dr. K. Krishna Chairman, Education Forum, IP Kerala State Branch, and Principal of St. James College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Chalakudi, to convey the significance of this great day. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Very good morning and welcome to every one of you. Uh, today's our chief guest of today's function, uh, Dr. Uh, and Professor Sandhi Kumar Nair, uh, the Dean of Amrita Center for Nanoscience and uh, uh, med uh, Molecular Medicine, and the, of course, our energetic president of uh, today's function, Dr. Pujay Shagar, sir, and our dynamic uh, secretary, uh, Dr. John Joseph, sir, and our resource persons of the day, uh, Dr. Vilpi, as well as Sri Jasi Nair, and uh, our uh, the moderator is Arun Rashi, as well as Bobby, and uh, also the keynote uh, address introducer, our beloved principal of Amrita uh, School I'm of Pharmacy, uh, Dr. Sabida, then uh, uh, the vote of thanks you delivered by Dr. David, and also the felicitations given by our uh, uh, Kala Madam, as well as uh, Mohammed Anifa, and uh, my dear, dear, dear students of various institutions of our state. I have immense pleasure to be a part and parcel of today's uh, National Science Day function. And already in our welcome speech, as well as our presidential address, they have given the importance of the Science Day. And uh, everyone we know, we are celebrating from 1987, John Joseph Sir already mentioned, that will be the recommendation from the National Council of Science and Technology and Communication. They have recommended to the government uh, to celebrate this 28th of February uh, for, as a National Science Day. From that 1986 they appeal and 1987 onwards in India, we are celebrating every 28th of uh, February, we are celebrating National Science Day. The reason for this, that is the uh, discovery of the, to mark the discovery of Raman effect that was in 1928, 28th of February. So that is the importance of that day. And for that discovery, uh, Sir C.B. Raman uh, awarded the Nobel Prize as an Indian physician, Indian physicist. And uh, uh, the uh, mention about this National Science Day, already the President as well as uh, Secretary has uh, pointed out uh, that this is mainly we are celebrating this National Science Day to inculcate to the public, to the society, about the importance of the science and technology in our daily life. So even our ancestors are using so many technologies and this one, but it is not documented and as such, we are following it. Nowadays, uh, already Sark has pointed out, even the nano science. Today is our chief guest in his keynote address. He will explain about the importance of our uh, the nanoscience, especially in the case of uh, pharmaceutical industry, because of uh, some toxic materials, because of the nano doses, which we can use very potentially and very actively. Uh, and that can be uh, useful to the society as a whole. So that technology, nanotechnology, is the most important win uh, for the coming days. And also the recent trends by uh, Dr. Wilby as well as Rijasi Nair, the trends in the pharmacy. This also will be useful to our students. And our president already has pointed out that this is to inculcate to our young generation and to our young pharmacists uh, to do the research activities and any research activities that will be useful to the society as a whole. That is the outcome of any research activity. That is the importance of this science day and the basics of this research and its importance to inculcate to our young generations. And before concluding, I, we talked about the Raman effect. I just want to uh, say because uh, President and uh, this one, they have mentioned about all other things, but exactly what is a Raman effect? Uh, that is uh, very, very useful even nowadays, even in our pharmaceutical field that we are using as a Raman spectroscopy, that is the extension of that is in the fingerprints of to find out the useful materials as well as to 
make a different types of new formulations. The Raman effect, it is uh, nothing but uh, it is uh, when any molecule, when it is excited in an energy, high energy level, always the photons are scattered. That is a usual procedure. And these scattered photons are usually when the incident uh, that the photons, the same energy level that will be excited and that will be go in the different direction. That is a normal scattered light photons process. So the energy level is same. The energy level same means it's nothing but it is having the same frequency and the same vibrations. But however, in some molecules, when the Sir C. V. Raman's discovery, when some molecules, when it is excited, in that 10 in 1 million, that is their statistics they are saying, some photons, they are not elas elastically uh, scattered, but in the case of the Raman effect, inelastically they are scattering it out that means their energy level is different from the incident line so this difference he is found out that the difference will be changed and to entered that onto a raman spectroscopy that is the extension which we are using for the fingerprints and other things nowadays we are using even in our pharmaceutical industry put into nutshell the raman effect is the inelastic scattering of photons and the normal scattering of the photons that are elastically scattered. These are the differences which he got the Nobel Prize in physics. So with this, wish you all the best for all my young generation pharmacists. So this is Science Day and we are celebrating to inculcate the research uh, importance and that it should be in the, uh, useful to our daily life. All our pharmacists should uh, go through that. That's why even in our syllabus, even our eighth semester B from Manoladar cabin, we are giving the importance of the projects and uh, the uh, uh, school of pharmacy, all pharmacy schools, all these things which are inculcating the importance of the uh, practice as well as practicing pharmacy and also the importance of the research activities. And with this, wish you all the best. I take this opportunity to congratulate the IPA state branch to select the uh, our chief guest and the Correct resource persons the act of the day, the nanoscience as well as the recent developments. And thank you very much once again. And to congratulate the IPA, State Bank President, Secretary, and all the office bearers, and also all the organizers which you are behind this to uh, the correct time we have start. And to all, so many of our students and colleges in the state, around the 50 colleges are participating at a time uh, to hear that one. So thank you very much once again to every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the inspirational words. Here we are moving to the most awaiting moment. I invite Dr. Sabida M, Principal, Amada School of Pharmacy, Amarda Vishwavidya Pidam, Kochi, to introduce our chief guest, Professor Shantikumar Nair, Dean, Amada Center for Nan Nanosciences and Molecular Medicine, Amarda Vishwavidya Pidam, Kochi, who is inaugurating the function and also to deliver the keynote address. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Hope that I am audible. Yes, Nami, you are audible. Okay. A respected uh, Chief Guest of the Day, Dr. Shandi Kumar V. Nair, uh, respected Dr. Jay Shekhar, President of, President of IPA Kerala State Branch, as well as all other distinguished leaders of the IPA Kerala Branch, respected principals, faculty members, and students of the various pharmacy colleges attending this program, a very warm good morning to all of you. First of all, I would like to appreciate and congratulate the Education Forum of IPA Kerala State Branch for organizing this program on a very relevant day, the National Science Day. I'm honored to introduce the chief guest of the day, Dr. Shanti Kumar V. Nair. One second, please. Hope that the slide is visible. Yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 I'm honored to introduce the chief guest of the day, Dr. Shandi Kumar V. Nair, who is the Dean of Nanosciences of Amrita Vishavidya Bidham and Director of Amrita Center for Nanosciences and Molecular Medicine. Sir completed his Bachelor of Technology B.Tech in Metallurgical Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Mumbai, and then MS and PhD in Material Science and Engineering from Columbia University, USA. He joined the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering Department at the University of Massachusetts 
and served there for more than two decades and joined Amrita Vishavidya Pitham in the year 2006. He has served as the chairman for Bioengineering Task Force and member of the DBT Nanobiotechnology Task Force. Also, member of the Board of Governors for the Institute of what's it? Board of Governors for the Institute of Nanoscience and Technology, Mohali, Punjab. He has served as member of Nano Applications and Technology Advisory Group, Government of India, and member of the Nano Medicine Task Force of ICMR. He was also a member of the Vision 2035 Task Force of ICMR. He is the recipient of the prestigious Presidential Young Investigator Award from President Ronald Reagan for research in composite materials in 1986. He has also received MRSI medal in 20, 2009 for outstanding contributions in the field of material science. He's the recipient of prestigious National Research Award from Government of India in the year 2011 for research in nanosciences. He has also received the prestigious CNR Rao India Nanosciences Award in 2014 for outstanding contributions in nanotechnology research and development, development in India. In July 2015, Sir was honored with the invitation to speak at the UNAI's START Conference on Technology for Sustainable Development at the United Nations Headquarters at New York, USA. Sir was awarded the Distinguished Alumni Award of IIT Mumbai in the year 2016. Sir has established the Amrita Center for Nanosciences and Molecular Medicine, which is one of the premier institutes in India. The center till date has published more than 500 papers with a median impact factor of about four, graduated, graduated 50 PhDs and developed almost a dozen of innovative products, which are at various stages of translation to the society. Sir was a joint developer of some of the products and is a joint inventor on almost 40 patent applications and 30 granted patents. Sir was an inventor on two granted US patents jointly with United Technologies Corporation USA on high temperature coatings for gas turbine applications. He's pioneering India's first nanomedical GMP facility, which is attempting to translate some of the innovative products to the clinic. Till date, Sir has published over 600 papers in nanomaterials, nanomaterials for medicine and bioengineering. He has an H index of 85, and also received over 20 research grant awards in the past 10 years in the area of nanotechnology. He is an author of five books and more than two dozen book chapters. Sir is very closely associated with Amrita School of Pharmacy and so is aware about the various academic programs of pharmacy, their scope, as well as the kind of research carried out by pharmacy faculty and students. We are honored to have an eminent academician and researcher with us today as the chief guest to deliver the keynote address. On behalf of the entire team of IPA Kerala State Branch and all gathered here, I extend a very hearty welcome to Dr. Shanti Kumar V. Nair and invite him to deliver the keynote address. Over to you, sir. You are muted, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabita. I didn't realize uh, introducing me is, is become a talk in itself with slides. <laughs> but thank you so much for, for such an effusive and, uh, uh, you know, introduction about my background that was really not necessary, but thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Dr. Jay Shaker, who's the president of IPA for his vision to have an international science day. It's a very timely one because I think India is really catapulting into the science area and is going to make rather huge contributions. And I think that we are going to become leaders and that's, so it's a very timely thing. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Krishna Kumar for his very insightful words as chairman of the Educational Forum. 
his understanding of uh, where science is headed in India. Uh, and most of all, I want to welcome uh, the young students from so many different colleges uh, that are here. It's so encouraging and exciting to see all of you here. I'm so glad that you came. You also know that not very long ago, maybe just two weeks ago, it was also uh, uh, Science Day, the Women Science, Women in Science Day. I think that was February 11 or 12. Kerala is one of the leaders, I think, in India in bringing women into, uh, into higher education and science. And I think uh, that that's a tremendous accomplishment of our own state in bringing so many women to recognize the importance of research and science. And so this is also a very uh, special day for us to, uh, to celebrate Science Day at the uh, uh, immediately after our Women in Science Day. So let me put up uh, very quickly my presentation. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Can can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. All right, thanks. So today, today I want to uh, talk about nanomedicine. I was asked to talk about nanomedicine and molecular medicine and review that. Uh, you realize that actually it's a medical science of scale. When you go down in scale from the conventional sizes, even micron sizes, and go down to scales that are some multiples of 10 to the minus nanometer, you get a new science, virtually a new science, which has tremendous and enormous applications in medicine. So that's why I called nanoscience the medical science of scale. So today's talk is going to be the medical science of scale. So where I will cover nanomedicine and molecular medicine. First of all, I want to uh, just introduce a, just a little bit about our university and the center. I won't take too much time. Um, uh, even before that, I want to acknowledge, I like to acknowledge at the beginning rather than at the end. Um, two agencies in India, um, the government of India has provided tremendous support to our center. Department of Biotechnology and Department of Science and Technology, particularly with the vision of Professor C.N.R. Rao, who has seen the pulse of nanosciences as making great strides in India. We have received a lot of support for the application of nanotechnology in medicine. That's an area which has tremendous potential. And over the last 15 years, they've given a substantial support. And also I want to thank our own university under the leadership of Sri Mata Amradhanamai, uh, who felt research was one of the most important aspects of education and provided unimaginable infrastructure and equipment support to take this forward in a strong way. The center that was established in 2006 uh, was a center for nanosciences and molecular medicine. And we realized, in fact, it was Amma's vision at that time itself in 2006, that nanosciences is going to play a huge role in medicine. And we established that center inside a major multi-specialty hospital. So it was, as you know from the introduction, I'm an engineer, I'm a materials engineer, I'm a material scientist. So to set up a research facility inside virtually, inside a hospital that was engineering related, 
was initially a surprise for many people, but it turned out that it was one of the best decisions that we made because we brought together material science, nanomaterials, engineering, physics, chemistry, and all of that together into medical sciences. So this is one of the themes of my talk is the importance of such an interdisciplinary broad exposure to be successful today. To be successful today in medical area, in pharmacy area, one needs to broaden ourselves. And our, from my side, as that MDP has moved to set up Nano Center in Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, but really coming at the inspiration of our Chancellor Rama became a symbol for how important it is to bring in technology into medicine. So we have also, uh, uh, our campuses are spread out all over different states and we are having a center come up in Delhi and we are very proud to be accredited A++ by NAC and uh, we have uh, now very good impact rankings and our center is focused on training in cutting edge areas so we're not teaching uh, just simply chemistry biology physics engineering mechanical engineering electrical engineering but we are teaching interdisciplinary cutting edge areas because we feel that students in today's academic environment must have that interdisciplinary exposure. So we have courses both at the PG and UG level in molecular medicine, which is a very interdisciplinary program, nanobiotechnology, which is the application of nanotechnology in biology and medicine. We also have a, a program in nanoengineering, which is more technology oriented. So these are not the kind of MSc and tech programs that you would read in a brochure. These are more cutting edge and it is designed to capitalize on the need for interdisciplinary training. So uh, let me just uh, say a little bit about the theme of Science Day, I think it has to be research. And all of you young people are coming to universities to get educated. And maybe you're not fully understanding what really is meant by research. It's not just sitting in classes, right, and passing courses. The theme of Science Day has to be research. So that means it is going beyond what science is teaching. So that's a new concept that we need to expand our own horizons. We need to develop new understanding. And that means we have to have the freedom to explore and the courage to question. Even in my classes, when I ask students a question, sometimes I get a lot of blank looks. Uh, people are afraid to to raise questions. Um, I think in India, we need to give our young students much more freedom to explore and question. Be very, very critical. And I think that's something that is happening, but needs to happen much, much more. And that imagination and dreaming is really actually something that comes from within, that we go beyond conventional thought. And that's what Science Day should be about. Do you have the courage to think beyond your textbooks and ask questions and pursue those questions to the finish? If we can do that, we'll have a lot more C.V. Ramans here very soon. That's fundamentally what is required. So I just mentioned women in science. I, even when I look at some of the pictures on my screen, I see mostly women rather than men. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Uh, women have that capacity to 
you science for the benefit of society, that compassion aspect is something that I think women can contribute a lot. Science should not be for the sake of science alone. It should have a benefit for society. Uh, uh, we should reward scientists. Uh, I believe that scientists should not have any economic insecurities. We should pay them well. They should not worry about the economics, but we should, they should be accountable. So in this century, we're talking about the 21st century, there are two aspects or three aspects that I want to emphasize. One is the interdisciplinary aspect. The reality is that you cannot avoid it. You cannot work in silos. You cannot say, I'm a pharmacologist, and all I know are pharmacology textbooks. It doesn't work like that. Secondly, we have to get out of our ivory tower. What do I mean by ivory tower? Do not just think that what you do just simply in a laboratory, in the idealized experiments, is the way that will result in products coming to the society. There is a field of research that goes beyond the confines of just idealized lab research to practical application needs, and that's called translational research. We have to do research that is of a translational nature, which means that how do you take some principle that you have proved in a lab and make it applicable to society? How do you, you have to do a lot more research. So those are two aspects that I want to do. The third part is the idea of which I just mentioned, compassionate research. Develop something that is useful. Think of the society around you, what the people need, what are the needs that uh, as a pharmacy group, you feel is so needed to help people. Brainstorm, come up with ideas, and think of something that will actually have use. So the emphasis then is the interdisciplinary aspects, and as I mentioned, materials, medicine, engineering, biology, chemistry, physics, computer sciences, are all needed in modern medical research. And I think now we no longer can have engineering, math, and bio streams as separate. I think that the, these are gone. People in the bio field and in the medical field need a lot of math. For example, statistics are becoming more sophisticated. Big data and, big, and data analytics are becoming important. So we need to look at that. If you're doing drug discovery, if you're doing epidemiology, climate change is not related to you, but you're, you're generating because we have powerful machines. We are generating a lot of data. How do you analyze all that data? You need to bring in artificial intelligence, which means training the computer to think and make sense of all that large data. How are you going to do that if you don't know any math? So uh, bio streams must be strong in math. So basically what I'm saying is, you heard the saying, jack of all trades, master of none. That's a famous quotation. But what I'm saying is, jack of all trades, master of one. Yes, you should be strong in one area that you choose to be an expert in, but you must have strong exposure to a multitude of different areas. You just simply cannot avoid it. If uh, I think all of you in chemistry and pharmacy should have background in materials, engineering, biology, math, chemistry, and physics. I think that's really required. And I think that this is going to happen soon. The translational aspect means taking the concept from the lab into practice, which means you have to design and manufacture something. What are the limitations there? It has to be reproducible. It has to be scalable. You have to make tons of something or you have to make thousands of products. 
how do you scale it how do you how is it sustainable are you going to create a lot of waste which can never be recovered uh, what are the regulatory limitations if you're going to bring out a medicine how are you going to ensure that it is safe for instance and it has sufficient efficacy there are regulatory norms for it it's not like just simply doing a proof of concept in a lab regulatory requirements are much more demanding and you should be account should be exposed to these translational requirements in order to succeed today that's how it works uh, okay intellectual property and commercialization now this is something that maybe you, a lot of you may not have heard about but when you get into bringing out a product into the market you also have to deal with intellectual property and commercialization i think exposure of young people to intellectual property and commercialization will really help in bringing up startups which can succeed you know when bill gates started microsoft he was just out of high school so but you have to have that knack the understanding of commercialization and intellectual property and be able to take advantage of it and use it to come out with wonderful products that will really help so that's also and then basically expanding the role of industry one of the things that i always say is we must have much much more participation between industry and academia i think that academia working on its own becomes a little bit ivory tower industry working on its own results in no innovation just selling things so if the two come together we'll have innovation and we have practical applications so we need to put a lot of effort into that so now i'll come to the topic which i'll just spend a little bit of time not too much and that is uh scale now i'll look at two scales nano scale and molecular scale the nano scale is roughly about 100 nanometers which is 100 times 10 to the minus 9 meters because at that scale there are very significant changes in properties of materials the surface area goes up the biological activity goes up the toxicity changes uh, the st stability changes so you are actually coming up with a completely new material molecular scale is basically much smaller than that and the combination of the molecular scale with the nano scale can give rise to many very interesting products so let me start since today we are honoring cv raman we will start with the raman application okay uh, let me uh, can you actually let me put this there. yeah we we'll start with a Raman application that we developed, which is that we shine a laser light on a patient sample, which is put on a nano structured surface. There's a nano scale surface. So we shine light on it and the sample emits a Raman signal so you can get a, uh, you know, a spectrum from the sample in the form of Raman signals. Now, when the sample is sitting on a nanostructured surface, the Raman signals are substantially enhanced. Now, if we bring in data analytics and artificial intelligence, that is, you train the computer to understand very small changes in spectra that result from the sample you can then tell what is the chemistry and what is the nature of the sample itself so in this case what we did was we applied it to detecting cancer so if you put a, a sample of 
tissue on it and it, you don't have to biopsy something you can just rub the nanosurface on the skin so that some of the molecules from the suspected area will be on the nanoscale surface. Then by looking at the Raman signal, we can within 10 to 20 minutes be able to tell whether that suspected lesion is a normal region. This is green is normal. Uh, uh, orange is a low grade tumor purple is a high-grade tumor. So with 98% accuracy, you can use a Raman signal to non-invasively detect whether a suspected lesion is a tumor or not. So all you have to do is shine light on the surface and use a little probe that has a nanostructured features on it touch the suspected area, shine light on it, and within 10 to 20 minutes, we'll know whether it is tumor or not. Can you imagine how incredibly useful it is? You don't have to take a biopsy. You just shine light on it, and you can tell whether it's cancer or not. This is coming from our beloved Raman effect, which is really what we are celebrating today. And Around the world, people are using Raman signals for diagnostic purposes, um, and we have optimized it into a very portable package that we can use to carry around in the villages and basically do an epidemiology of, say, oral cancer, just simply shine light in the mouth and be able to tell whether there's cancer or not. So it's an extremely useful way to be able to detect these cancers early without taking a biopsy. So that's an example of how nano scale, because the scale is very small, it enhances the field and creates a much larger Norman signal. If we did not have this nano scale surface, the accuracy of prediction will not be that good. So therefore, we can combine scale with Raman and get a very interesting practical application. So now um, let me go to other frontiers in nanomedicine and molecular medicine, um, which is all involves integration of technology with molecular sciences. That's what nanomedicine is. And what we are doing is looking at targets, molecular targets. So if you target the nanoparticle, and I'll give you an example of these things, to the disease cell, you can have a very targeted treatment. You can target immune cells. You, you, that will give rise to immune therapy. You can also uh, target immune markers on disease cancer cells, and that will also be a form of immune therapy. You can target the brain. Uh, design the nanosystem to cross the blood-brain barrier. So the advantage of scale is that you can use it to specifically target molecular markers and tight junctions, even in the intestine, by targeting tight junctions, you can improve the absorption of the drug into the blood. Many oral drugs don't have sufficient bioavailability, and so if you can use the nanoscale to improve the bioavailability, that would be uh, a big advantage. Then metronomic therapy, so slow or intermittent drug relief. Metronomic means it is time delayed. That is, metronome is, uh, refers to time, intermittent time delayed process. So metronomic therapy has become a very important area where slow or intermediate intermittent drug release happens. And the advantage is, supposing you take something that is, has very short half-life, many drugs have short half-life, if you encapsulate it into a nanomaterial, you can improve the half-life. I'll give you an example of work we did uh, where you try to improve the half-life by 
here we were looking at testosterone levels, testosterone delivery, which is an important application in many cases. And uh, you can see that now testosterone has a half-life of 10 minutes. So you cannot keep on injecting testosterone every 10 minutes. So we have developed a system where once you inject testosterone on day zero, you can get a sustained release profile above the normal level of testosterone in the body, which is shown by this white band. You can get testosterone levels for 30 days, 30 days. That's a remarkable and tremendous improvement. So instead of injecting and giving therapy, every hour, every two hours. For example, if you're taking Tylenol, you have to take the Tylenol tablet every four hours. But imagine if you could take the tablet today and it lasts for two days, that's a tremendous thing. Now, certain critical uh, drugs like hormonal drugs are really, really important that we don't keep on injecting into the body. So, uh, that's another very valuable part of it. And personalized medicine, you can target based upon your molecular profile, I can treat you. I don't need to treat you with any random drugs. I can look at your molecular profile and I can treat you according to that. And that's called personalized treatment. And I just showed you high sensitivity for detection uh, and so on. Now, to create a nanomedicine is like creating a device, a device at the nanoscale. If you look at the picture here, you have a nanoparticle, and on the nanoparticle are attached various molecules, aptamers, which are peptides, proteins, antibodies, other types of peptides, small molecules, like small molecule drugs. Um, could be attached, antimicrobial drugs, carbohydrates, nucleic acid, e for gene therapy. Um, you could attach to the outside. You could also add, if you go to the, um, these molecules can be used to target disease cells and such as cancer and so on. And uh, if you look at this, you have, Yellow, yellow refers to the drug inside a nanoparticle, and these green arrows refer to targeting ligands. And I've uh, shown that here. Um, and targeting ligands will take you specifically to the cells in question. You can put drugs in there. You can put contrast agents in there. The yellow is actually the contrast agent. Uh, you can. The contrast agent helps you track where the medicine is going. And the shell protects the drug from being degraded by the plasma, by the blood when it's injected into the blood. So uh, the other ways that you can add molecules that allow it to, to, to circulate in the bloodstream for a longer time are all so you can see that this is not a drug. It's a, it's a machine. It's a robot. You have so many things in there that has so many functions. So a nanomedicine is truly an integrated interdisciplinary concept. It's not just a drug. It has so many other things associated with it that give it useful new functions. And that's why nanomedicine has become a thing that is tremendously under research. There are a lot of nanomedicine formulations that are already in the market and it's going to grow in a tremendous way. Um, and because nanomedicines are small, they can enter the cell. They are small enough to enter the cell. They can track specific uh, pathways, cellular pathways of action, you can go inside the nucleus and deliver genetic material and so on. And so 
such a potential for therapy had never existed before nanomedicines came into the picture. We used to just simply inject the drug, the drug would go into the bloodstream, and then we hoped that it would get to where it needs to go and have the efficacy that it needs to have. But now you can target it to a specific cell. You can target it to specific things inside the cell. And you can control the pharmacokinetics and efficacy and toxicity. So these are all aspects that you should keep in mind that uh, allows us to have a lot of control. Now, we have also created luminescent materials that I'll show you here. The right side is basically um, um, nanomedicine nanoparticles which have been made luminous by adding 25 atom gold clusters in there. So you can see where they go. Here's an example of a beautiful application. I, I attach antibodies to these clusters, which take it to leukemia cells. And now, lo and behold, the leukemia cells specifically are decorated by this red boundary because they are targeted to the leukemia cells through this antibody and they glow red. So I can use a fax, losses assisted cell uh, sorter. I can use a fax system to immediately detect visually whether the blood has leukemia cells or not. So again, the idea of a diagnostic tool, which is cell targeted is a beautiful one. Um, and the same thing also can be done um, with, with the cancer treatment. If a cell expresses something, for example, here the cell expresses transferrin, which converts uh, iron into a, basically absorbs iron from the rest of the extracellular matrix. Uh, you can now target it by putting uh, a nanoparticle with transferrin protein on the outside and they'll go straight to these cells and deliver its load. So you can use core shell systems like this, which will allow us to target the material. And when you use a core shell system, the efficacy of the treatment is very good. So I can put one drug in the core and one drug in the shell, and we can use what is known as polypharmaceutics, which has a very powerful impact on treatment. And uh, how much time do you have? Am I almost done? Otherwise I can wrap up right now. Yeah, you can maybe five minutes more, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, I also want to give you some quick examples because time is very short. Uh, really, this requires a whole day to go through. Each of these is like a separate talk. But what I wanted to mention is here's an example where physics and chemistry comes into it in a very big way. You take a drug called a photomedicine. Once you remove the tumor in the brain, you put the photomedicine there and shine light on it. See, you just shine light on it through a fiber optic cable and the light interacts with the photomedicine, releases, um, you know, reactive oxygen species, ROS, and kills any residual tumor that there is in that region. So again, it's a light-based therapy and one has to understand the physics of the light drug interaction, one has to also be able to put the drug into a gel-like system. So we need a lot of chemistry background to be able to do that. So just simply discovering a molecule sometimes is not enough. You have to now understand chemistry, understand the physics of the application, and then only one can take full advantage of it. So here we have put the drug inside a patent and nanoparticle. This is the photodrug and made it into a gel. 
and then um, we have found very interestingly that the absorption of light when the drug is inside the nanoparticle is you know 60 70 times that of when you just have the free drug without the nanoparticle so what happens therefore um, is that when you have a nanoparticle in the gel with the drug you get a lot more reactive oxygen species than you get with the free drug lot lot more so it's much more efficacy you need lower laser fluence you they get less toxicity you get more efficacy so that's uh, uh, again a physics why does absorption go up when the drug is inside a nanoparticle it has to do with the quantum constraints of the nanoparticle that focuses the light on the drug much more so one needs to study that one has to have some appreciation of the physics of that you see here the, the purple one is the gel and the single oxygen emission is much much more when the drug is in the nanoparticle so you get much more efficacy automatically and uh, much more um, cell kill when you use the gel as opposed to the free drug so those are some of the things then other example is bioavailability we can these nanoparticles are absorbed by the intestinal tissues of course we have to design them and make them in a GMP facility, um, that's a translational part. It's not enough to just do something in a lab. You have to go to a clean room facility that is, that is uh, ISO approved, that is approved by regulatory bodies, and then make the material there. This is something that we is from the GMP facility of our center they use uh, they're developing these protein nanomedicines inside the gmp facility and the beautiful part of it is that these nanoparticles have mucoadhesive layer and mucopenetrative layers so they through the intestine they penetrate and get into the bloodstream and the bioavailability goes up tremendously so the same drug that don't otherwise get into the bloodstream gets a lot into the bloodstream and gives rise to much higher pharmacokinetics and this picture of the bottle is our uh, actual gmp produced drug with the high bioavailability so uh, we'll, so now i think uh, i'll just summarize i'm sorry if i went a little bit faster than i would have liked um, so we are the new science of scale which says that one can go down and scale and find tremendous new applications and these applications is very interdisciplinary and translational that when you combine molecular medicine and nanomedicine along with technology we can create new therapies new diagnostics by taking advantage of scale and uh, other aspect is we really need to have strength in computer sciences and artificial intelligence uh, we teach courses in bioinformatics um, as as well as data analytics and ai so uh, we we need to have access to that to be able to do drug discovery to be able to uh, develop uh, and analyze all the data that we get from patients so uh, all of these exposures now is becoming more and more not the the realm of some exclusive scientists but it is more and more what every one of you should have exposure to i think these should be folded into pharmacy courses so um, that's how i wanted to to summarize and, and end here uh science is in a very exciting place in india we are really becoming more innovative india is putting a lot of money into science and young people must be motivated and inspired 
to do good science, good science, innovation science, not just simply know what everybody does, what is already known, and just simply be in the lab and learn the standard things, which is important, but you need to do innovation science. And for that, you have to broaden your thinking, you have to develop that inner excitement and motivation to do that. You have to have some courage. You should not be thinking, you know, well, we'll always if you're just thinking, you know, will I make money with this? It's not really the way to think. Do You have to think about it in a, in a different way. If you are excited about what you're doing, you'll always do well. Thank you very much. So Dr. Sabida? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much, sir, for explaining the basics of research, the importance of interdisciplinary and translational research, and also for motivating students to do good and innovative research and to uh, make them think more critically and then for encouraging them especially to ask questions that is i think very very important especially in the last two years when everything was online the interaction or response from students from were like very much reduced even now when we are back to an offline mode we see that the response is like very less so students must be motivated to ask questions to themselves as well as well as to ask questions and clear their doubts when they are attending lectures rather than just learning from what is taught in the classrooms and what they read from the textbooks. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for explaining the applications of nanomedicine and molecular medicine uh, for various things like improving the oral bioavailability of drugs, for getting time-dependent, time-delayed release, as well as for targeting uh, drugs to the disease site, also for diagnosis. So you very well explained with very good examples. And I hope that the students are really motivated to research and science. On behalf of IPA, I thank Shanti Kumar, sir, for spending time with us and motivating the young minds and all the students and faculty of the pharmacy schools across Kerala. IPA would like to present a certificate to sir as a token of appreciation. Uh, I, I request Dr. Limsey to present, yes. So once again, thank you very much, sir. On behalf of the entire team of the Education Forum, as well as the Kerala State Branch of IPA, I thank you, sir, for uh, delivering the keynote address and inspiring the young minds. Thank you thank, very much. Thank, thank, thank you, you and I hope that the young uh, students are genuinely take up science in an innovative way. That will be a wonderful <laughs> thing. And that's the most important thing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Limsey. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Now, it's, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Arun Rashid, Professor, Pharmaceutical Chemistry, Al Shifa College of Pharmacy, Malapuram, to introduce Dr. Wilby Diaz, who is going to deliver the talk regarding the recent trends in drug delivery. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Madam, it is audible. Yes, it's audible, sir. madam. It's audible. Yes, sir. It's audible. Okay. So, good morning, one and all. Uh, distinguished IPA members and uh, faculty members and teachers, principal and students of various colleges of pharmacy. It's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wilby as a professor, uh, assistant professor, College of Pharmaceutical Science, Trivandrum, as a resource person today's invited topic, drug discovery process. So Dr. Wilby graduated from B Pharm and M Pharm from College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Trivandrum. And he obtained her PhD from ICER Pune, so, and his research interest includes application of molecular modeling techniques such as docking, molecular dynamic simulations, and metadynamic simulation, umbrella sampling, and quantum chemical calculations in rational drug design, and development and understanding the molecular mechanism involved in the various molecular recognition process. And also, she published eight research papers in prestigious American Chemical Society and Royal Society of 
chemistry billy in the sciences and currently she is working under working the research topic on drug repurposing strategy to identify rdrp inhibitors of sars cov2 with great pleasure and honor i inviting dr will be to talk the topic of drug discovery process over to you ma'am madam will be ma'am good morning all am i audible am i yeah, audible? Yeah, yes yes they are audible yes madam yes madam okay i shall share the screen yes uh, can you just enable uh, the participant for screen sharing uh, yes madam yes madam it's audible you can proceed madam can you enable uh, the participant uh, for sharing the screen madam you are the co-host you can share madam madam you are the co-host now yeah you can share yeah it's coming <clears throat> Once again, good morning, all, and thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. Uh, respected uh, President IPA Kerala State Branch, uh, Dr. P. J. Shivam sir, Secretary of IPA Kerala State uh, Branch, Dr. John Tilsip sir, and Chairman IPA Education Forum, Dr. P. Krishna Kumar sir, Dr. Shanti Kumar sir, and all other dignitaries and my dear students, with your, all your permission, I shall begin the presentation on recent trends in drug design and discovery. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, drug design and drug discovery process. As you all know, as the science advances, it treat and uh, uh, treat, cure, and palliate many ailments. Okay, so all of uh, you should have been wondered how all these medicines come into the market. And if you have never thought about it, I should suggest that you should start thinking about it now onwards. Okay, so uh, all these uh, diseases, the new emerging diseases actually initiates a complex process which is known as drug discovery process, which can consisting of different phases, processes, from the ideation to development involves the design of the drug, development of the drug, and its approval process. And this complex process actually uh, takes around 10 to 13 years. And what makes the process to take other because it involves the different phases and different processes, which will start from the ideation to development to approval. So we can classify uh, the general classes into four different phases. The first phase being early drug discovery process. So once you have uh, a disease, you know the target of the disease, or you know the causative reason of the disease, you can design the molecules from starting from a library of molecules. And the library of molecules may contain 10,000, 20,000, or even bigger number. And this involves the early drug discovery process. And this involves the design of the molecules and the optimization of the molecules, synthesis, characterization, etc. So from the 10,000 molecule, you can screen the molecule up to 250 compounds with a phase, which is known as preclinical phase. This actually involves in vitro analysis, in vivo analysis, DNA parameters, etc. And from the 250 compounds, you can bring down uh, the uh, molecules to five compounds, which includes several clinical phases, including clinical phase one, two, three, etc. And uh, finally, it will reach the phase of the regulatory approval phase. From the five compounds, one drug actually uh, reaches the market. Okay, so you can see here one drug actually reaches the market. 
So this uh, drug discovery passes through several stages like this that makes it, makes it very long process. Now we can see what are the different processes involved in each of these um, uh, steps. So if you have uh, the first phase is an early drug discovery uh, process. So it uh, consisting of uh, the target identification means uh, you know the disease and you know the uh, receptors or enzymes or proteins or the small molecules which are responsible for the particular disease. And uh, if any of the newer molecule or small molecule which is able to modify the biological function of a particular receptor or an enzyme, then we can call that particular enzyme or the receptor to be a target. So you have to identify the target and you have to validate the target. You have to find the binding site of the target. That means the validation. Then you can screen the molecules, library of molecules using high throughput screening to generate the lead. So that is what is known as lead identification. And then you can further uh, uh, develop the assay and uh, other uh, screening methods like in silico screening methods so that you can generate the lead and then you can optimize the lead and further we can go for the synthesis and characterization. And once it passes the phase, it will reach the preclinical phase, which involves in vitro analysis, in vitro analysis, absorption, distribution, metabolism, extraction, toxicity studies, understanding the mechanism. I'm not going into the details because it is beyond the scope of this presentation because of limited time. And uh, once it passes the preclinical phase, it will reach the clinical phase, which includes different phases like phase one and two, three. And the phase one involves healthy volunteer studies, phase two and phase three involves studies in patient population. Uh, it also involves uh, the safety and efficacy studies. Once it passes the clinical phase, it will reach the regulatory approval First step is the filing of the application and then to get the approval from the National Regulatory Authority. And this doesn't end there. Uh, there is post-marketing monitoring of the drug candidate, which is uh, the phase four clinical trials, which will assess the long-term effect of the drug. So the drug discovery process has to follow through the long, long uh, steps. Uh, so I will concentrate more on the early drug discovery uh, phase, which is actually the uh, drug design uh, step. Okay. So as you all know, we know the disease, we know the target, we know the binding set. Identification, lead generation, optimization with help of high throughput screening in silico computational methods, etc. And then we have to go for synthesis and characterization. And this is the area where the medicinal chemist or pharmaceutical chemist has uh, uh, like optimum role. Okay, so this is the area in the drug discovery process where the medicinal chemist or pharmacist, uh, ph pharmaceutical chemist is having a major role. So this uh, medicinal chemistry actually deals with the design, optimization, and development of chemical compounds for use as drugs. And this basically involves two steps, which is design and optimization involving in silico screening and high throughput screening. I'm going to talk more about the design and optimization, which is in silico screening methods. So if you look at the silico screening method see that there are two approaches which has been used in in silico drug design which is structure based drug design and ligand based drug design and if you, if you look at the structure based drug design the situation where you know the disease you know the target but you don't have the 3d structure of the um, target so actually, you cannot go for the structure-based design. You have to go for the ligand-based and you have to still uh, design the ligand. And the several methods are involved in the design uh, of the ligand. If you don't know the 3D structure of the protein, this involves 3D QSAR, uh, that is three-dimensional quantitative structure activity relationship, which actually describes uh, the relationship between the structure and biological function. And then artificial intelligence, uh, which is a newer 
emerging technology for designing the new hooligans. Actually, uh, we use computational programs for designing the drug, dis uh, drug discovery process. So, uh, with respect to structure based drug design, here you, you know the 3D structure. You can see the 3D structure of the protein over here. You know the 3D structure of the protein, you know the binding site. Now you can use various computational methods such as molecular modeling methods for the study, which involves molecular docking, molecular dynamic simulations, and also you can use various binding free energy calculation studies such as uh, metadynamics, umbrella sampling simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, etc. So uh, this is actually uh, the, these processes such as uh, the, uh, the use of computers or computer programs. Uh, in designing of the drugs actually involves uh, uh, many uh, programming packages. Uh, so I'll go through each one of them. So I'm more interested in, in the molecular dynamics uh, simulations and binding energy calculations because uh, these are the uh, latest trends in drug design and discovery. So actually in silico, Methods are used in drug design, which involves the scientific experiments or research conducted or produced by means of computing, computer modeling or computer simulations. And basically, you can classify into two types, molecular mechanics and quantum mechanics. In molecular mechanics, you treat the molecule as a collection of atoms and bonds. So you have uh, like paracetamol, you will have uh, the collection of the carbons, you will have the collection of oxygen, you will have the collection of uh, bonds. So you will consider the molecular mechanics. You will in, in molecular mechanics, you will consider the molecule to be a collection of atoms and bonds. Whereas in quantum mechanics, you will consider the molecule as a collection of electrons. These are the main molecular modeling methods which are used uh, in drug designing, which is molecular mechanics and quantum mechanics. And with respect to uh, um, the in silico methods, what are the advantages of it? the experimental methods? Uh, the first one is it is low cost. No compound have to be purchased externally or synthesized, and it is possible to in investigate compounds that have not been synthesized yet. And computational methods reduce the initial number of compounds before conducting the high throughput screening. So you can use these methods for screening the molecules, and then uh, you can uh, go for um, high throughput screening. Lead optimization can also be done after initial virtual screening to ensure the biological activity. So the, actually, the use of computational approaches in drug discovery reduced the period of introduction of a new drug into the market from 30 years to 10 to 15 years. So in all the uh, uh, different phases of drug discovery, you can use the computer applications, but I am more focusing on to the drug design aspect, which is a uh, first phase of the drug discovery process. So a brief introduction to the molecular docking. Molecular docking is a process of predicting the binding capability and energy of a drug candidate to the active site of the receptor. So here you can consider the protein as a lock and the ligand as a key and docking is a process of testing whether the given key fits a particular lock. You can see a lock over here and there is a key, there is a protein, there is a ligand and it will bind and you will get a complex. Okay, so thereby the molecule will interact with the binding side of the protein. So if you, uh, you can also classify the docking into rigid docking and uh, flexible docking. So the problem associated uh, with the docking is uh, we cannot give full flexibility to the protein. To the uh, extent we can give the flexibility of the amino acids in the active site, and as well as we can give the flexibility to the ligand, but you cannot give the flexibility to the whole protein because uh, molecular docking is not that efficient to uh, uh, you know, generate uh, the dynamic simulations of the molecule. So uh, a more advanced method, which is a molecular uh, dynamic simulation method can also be used for studying the uh, physical movement of atoms and molecules. Here actually you can study the physical movement of the atoms and molecules. You can give full flexibility to the protein as well as uh, to the ligand molecule. And this follows uh, the principle of uh, Newton's equation, which is forces, forces equal to mass into acceleration and uh, which is forces again, the negative of the sum of the derivative of the potential of the molecule. 
And uh, so you can see uh, different uh, kinds of potentials uh, used in molecular dynamic simulations, which is stretching potential, which is due to the stretching of the bond, and then bending potential, which is the bending, which uh, involves with the bending of the molecule and the dihedral change in the dihedral angle of the molecule and there are non-bonding interactions which are actually interactions between two different molecules uh, and these interactions actually involve Lenato's potential and rib static interactions. So if you sum up all these potential, you will get the total potential and if you take the derivative of the negative of the derivative of that, you will get the force and uh, for the force mass is a constant property so you will get the acceleration if you know the acceleration you will get the velocity from the velocity you will uh, get the distance so uh, with respect to time the molecule move because it is undergoing vibrations so the molecule will move and using the molecular dynamic simulations you can know the positions at each time so thereby you can actually study the physical moment of the atoms and molecules. So know the position of the molecule with respect to time. That is advantage. So you can study all the other properties based on that. That is molecular dynamic simulation. And there are some limitations of the uh, docking and molecular dynamic simulation because uh, uh, this often fail to cross the energy barrier between local and global energy minimum of the reactants. Okay, so you can see the reaction coordinate. So reaction happens where reaction coordinate and this is a free energy of the uh, process and you can see a barrier and this is a local energy minima of the molecule. So the molecule starts from there, it has to cross the barrier and it has to reach the global energy minima for the reaction to happen. So normally, uh, this huge barrier, uh, so mostly we are dealing with the proteins and uh, proteins and uh, small molecules or the nucleic acids and sort small molecules. These are biological processes, which actually happens in the time interval of milliseconds. So actually, this molecular dynamic simulation and docking cannot uh, cross this barrier so that we won't get the reaction. So. Uh, we have to look for something which is much better than uh, the docking and molecular dynamic simulation and in this case metadynamics is a promising tool which is an accelerated uh, sampling technique which which will work in the framework of uh, molecular dynamic simulation so metadynamics is an accelerated sampling technique where we can cross a barrier faster to study the biological process so what is a molecular dynamic simulation? I'll explain to this respect uh, to a small molecule, um, A and B are the atoms in the molecule. You can see the balls here, A and B. And then uh, you have to do the reaction so that the uh, bond breaks. So, so the bond breaking is a process here. Okay, so since it has to break the bond, bond distance can be considered as a collective variable or the reaction coordinate in this particular process. Okay, so you have to break the bond. So you need a, a reaction coordinate. Reaction coordinate is nothing but the bond distance. Okay, so if you look at the free energy, you can see that the molecule AB is in the well here. It has to cross a barrier and reach here so that the bond breaking is completed, you get two molecules. So, so you have to cross energy barrier and have to reach here. Okay, so the metadynamic simulations actually accelerates this uh, process, uh, this process of uh, bond breaking by uh, adding some extra potentials so that the reaction becomes faster. So we have to add extra potentials. It has to cross the barrier faster and it will reach here. So it actually works in the framework of molecular dynamic simulations. It is nothing different from molecular dynamic simulation. The only thing is that you're accelerating the process by adding extra potentials other than the force field or natural potentials, what I have discussed earlier. So that is what is. Uh, yes, madam, you can proceed, madam. No problem. It's okay. So, you can compare the normal molecular dynamic simulations uh, with 
that are the metadynamic simulations. In this case, you can see that it has to cross a huge parallel. It will take around 3,000 years if you use the molecular dynamic simulations. But if you, when you compare it with the metadynamics, you can see that it will cross a barrier by adding extra potential. These are the representations of the extra potential which is being added. It will close the barrier and it will reach the state B. So you can cross a barrier in 300 nanosecond, uh, uh, the number of days, depending upon the total number of processors used. So this method is actually faster. And this method can be utilized for the drug design process with, because it, it is more reliable than the docking process because the docking actually gives you an empirical value but that is not more accurate because you are uh, doing some assumptions you are doing the calculations based on some assumptions but in here uh, you're actually uh, doing the process uh, um, by allowing all flexibility to the molecule to the proteins as well as to the ligand molecules that is advantage and this is faster also so uh, i would like to um, uh, share some um, uh, some research works I, which I have uh, done recently based on this newer uh, techniques and drug design, which is a well-compared metadynamic study to identify RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, allosteric inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2 based on drug repurposing strategy. So, so as you all know, what is SARS-CoV-2 and what is COVID-9, I will go quickly go through the history. So uh, the disease uh, started in China in 2019 and later it was confirmed with COVID-19 COVID uh, by World Health Organization. And, uh, re and on uh, 2020 March, uh, WHO declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic and uh, the first wave of uh, this disease happened uh, between March 2020 and June 2020 and the uh, strain responsible for this was mainly alpha strain of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, uh, next, uh, the first human trial of the coronavirus vaccine began in UK, led by an Oxford University team. And later on, uh, the first dose was given to a 90-year-old grandmother in UK. And the second wave started in March 2021 to August 2021, and the strain responsible for this was uh, mainly Delta strain. And uh, 20, uh, 21 India passed a milestone of administering 1 million COVID-19 vaccinations and uh, worldwide COVID-19 cases uh, uh, is uh, like uh, 435 million and then 5 lakh million of death so far. And uh, the third world started from number 2021 to January 2022 and the main strain responsible for this was uh, the Omicron. Okay, so even though uh, the vaccine has been developed uh, and has been given worldwide, uh, still the disease is there. So it is almost certain that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 will not be extinguished and will likely to remain as a human pathogen. Uh, so we have in need of uh, the proper vaccine development as well as uh, drug uh, treatment development. So, uh, uh, so as you, uh, I'm not talking about the vaccines and more uh, concentrating on the design of new molecules uh, for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. So before going to that, uh, you have to know what is SARS-CoV-2, what is the structure of the SARS-CoV-2, what could be the possible target. And if you look at the, the picture, you can see that the COVID-19 contains a single stranded, uh, this is a single stranded uh, positive sense RNA associated with the nuclear protein. And there are caps that composed of matrix proteins, matrix proteins. And you can see several uh, targets are involved uh, uh, in case of SARS-CoV-2, you can see the spike like a protein, a flu capsid protein, and drink like a protein, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, I have chosen uh, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase as a key target because it is the enzyme which is responsible for the synthesis of RNA in virus. And if you can stop the RNA synthesis, you can stop the replication and transcription translation processes. Thereby, you can actually the virus. So the target of choice for the growth of the virus. So um, you can look at the structure of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase starts cov 2 This is a structure, this is a graphic structure and uh, you can see the region from where the RNA actually gets 
in a simple size, this region is known as catalytic region. And you have the thumb, uh, palm, and finger regions. These are the three different regions of the SARS-CoV-2. And it has got a five binding site, which is a catalytic site, which I have shown you. And then it, it has got allosteric sites, thumb one, thumb two, palm one, and palm two. Uh, palm two. So uh, this allosteric site, molecule binds to the allosteric site, we cause some conformational changes over here. And that conformational change will affect the catalytic region. So they're well, they're right to inhibit the function of this particular uh, enzyme. Okay, so that is what is an allosteric site is the uh, region uh, with where the allosteric inhibitors actually go and bind. And in this case, we have got four different uh, allosteric sites, which are thumb one, thumb two, Palm one and palm two. These are the four different uh, binding sites. Now look at the drug design strategy. Which strategy will you follow for uh, the designing of the new molecules like in SARS or the RP? Uh, so you can uh, go with the two different process, like develop a new drug molecule and it has to go through all those phases and classes which I have explained earlier. So it is a dying consuming process, laborious and highly ex expensive and that has got high risk also. So the other uh, strategy is a drug repurposing strategy, which is very uh, fast and requires less time because we will start with the approved drug here. So the drug which has been used for treating some other disease can be selected, it can be validated and developed uh, for uh, treating uh, some other disease. That is what is drug repurposing strategy. So, so we cho chose to go with the drug uh, repurposing strategy because uh, it uh, takes less time. Okay, so here we have to start from the approved drug for the treatment of some other disease, which can be used as a um, as an initial candidates for the development of new molecules for treating the uh, particular disease. That is what is drug repurposing strategy is. So what are the criteria for selecting the candidates for drug repurposing strategy? In case of uh, SARS-CoV-2, we have to consider three things. Well, first one is you have to select a positive sense RNA virus because this is a positive sense RNA virus. So the, the, the drugs uh, uh, which should be active against the positive sense RNA virus should be selected. And then when you select the target, there should be similarity between the RNA dependent RNA polymerase of SARS-CoV-2 and that of the selected virus. So there should be sufficient similarity between the RDRP of the SARS-CoV-2 and the selected virus. And then uh, if you um, select a particular target, there should be sufficient number of drugs approved by FDA uh, for the study. So based on these three things, if you have chosen RDRP, Sense RNA virus, it's a good, there's a good sequence similarity of between the RDRP of HCV and SARS CoV 2. And it is only positive sense RNA virus for which there are a number of drugs available uh, in the market, which is most, most of them are under clinical trials. So, this is a sequence, this shows a sequence alignment of the RDRP of the um, SARS CoV 2 and HCV. The blue one represents HCV and the red one represents the SARS-CoV-2 RDRP. So you can see that the structure is almost similar. And you can see the catalytic region, which is represented by the stick model of the amino acids, you can see here. And it is also conserved, but uh, the RDRP is having an extra tail, which is, uh, for so far, it is not functional. OK, so here, the structural similar similarity is good. Even the catalytic site residue is also conserved in case of HCV. RDRP and SARS-CoV-2 RDRP. And this alignment has been done using a modular uh, program, which is a software for aligning the sequence. Then uh, when you look at the structure very closely, you can see that RDRP of HCV contains uh, uh, the palm region, which is represented by the green ribbon in both cases. And you can see the thumb region in both the cases and fingers also in both the regions. And if you look at the uh, allosteric side, you can see the thumb region in both the cases, thumb two, palm one, and palm four. So all the allosteric uh, sites are, uh, uh, 
conserved as well as the catalytic region. So the catalytic region of the the RPH C is somewhere here, and that of the SARS-CoV-2 is somewhere here. So the amino acids are also conserved in both the cases. So this is a suitable choice uh, for uh, developing uh, the new molecules based on the drug repurposing strategy. And what are those drugs which can be selected for our study? And this in, involved uh, thump one involved several drugs like the clavobutyl and thump two lomibuvir radalbuvir and thump palm one desabuvir citrobuvir and palm two nisubuvir etc. So these molecules are actually uh, selected for um, uh, 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 finding out the inhibitors of uh, thump one, thump two, palm two, and palm one of RDRP of SARS CoV 2. So, uh, I have chosen molecular dynamic uh, methods like uh, such as molecular docking uh, for finding out the binding energy of the molecule with respect to the active site of the um, RDRP, which is uh, palm one. Palm Palm two, thump one, and thump two elastic sites. So I have chosen uh, different molecules, and you can see the uh, uh, molecules: palm one, palm two, thump one, and thump two. And among which uh, the pigobuber of the palm two, uh, cetrobuber of palm one, uh, and DMC and filobuber of the thump two and thump one respectively, found to be uh, having more binding affinity towards the uh, RDRP of SARS-CoV-2. So the best ones were uh, these uh, molecules. So these molecules, uh, uh, I, I will just show the docking images of these molecules. Uh, so this is RDRP uh, of um, uh, cetrobuber complex. You can see the cetrobuber here, over here. This is a crystal structure representation. And now you can see the SARS-CoV-2 RDRP. You can see the one of the complex, which is the APT complex here. Uh, and then uh, you can see the desabuver complex here, citrobuver complex here. So I'm not showing other images because lack of time. And all the dock structures are further taken forward about metatarian simulations. And as you all know, the docking has some limitations because it cannot close a barrier easily. And also, uh, we are not giving full flexibility to the molecule. So to solve this problem, we actually use uh, well-tempered metatarian simulation. So this works in the framework of molecular dynamic simulation where we can uh, do the reaction very faster as well as we are giving full flexibility to the molecules. So the results will be more uh, reliable as compared to the docking costs. So this is the full 1D free energy surface obtained after metal dynamic simulations against, uh, this is free energy against the distance. And uh, so here in case of, as I said earlier, in case of metadynamics, we can choose any reaction coordinate. I have told you the example. In the RDRP and the drug molecule as one of the coordinates or one of the reaction uh, coordinate. And then you can take a number of contact uh, between uh, the drug as well as the RDRP and say. So it represents how close the drug is to the protein. If it is closer, then the number of contacts will be higher. And if it is far, uh, the number of contacts will be zero. And if the distance is uh, very small, it indicates that there is binding. That means that the RP and the uh, drug molecule is very closer. And the value is very high, it represents that it is actually far away. So you can study the bar any passes in detail and uh, as the studies we have found that the is having the free energy value of minus 16 kilocalorie per mole which is going to be more forming more stable complex uh, with the rdrp and uh, you can look at the two-dimensional free energy surface obtained after metadynamics uh, this is a number of contact um, one of the coordinate is a number of contact. That means how many contact uh, the drug will form with the uh, RDRP enzyme. That is a number of contact. And if it is small, then it represents there is no contact. If it is high, it represents there is contact. Okay. Now we can see the distance x also. So the uh, smaller x represents 1, 1.5, 2.5 represents the drug is very close to the active site of the en uh, enzyme and if it is far, uh, if it is like 10 or uh, 15 the represents, you can see here there is no, no contour diagram. So this is actually a contour diagram of the free energy surface uh, obtained after meridianals. And these terms actually, I cannot cover all these things here because uh, there is limited time and it is beyond the scope. Uh, so you can, if you have any doubt, you can uh, email me personally so I can explain more. 
and the techniques how to use this metadynamics for studying uh, different drug design processes. Okay, so the, you can see that uh, in this case, the drug is very closer, and in this case, that is a little bit far away. So it is represented by the large number of contacts and shorter distances. And here also, you can see that the large distances and uh, sorry, uh, large number of contacts and the small distances. So, uh, so actually, this uh, free energy diagram itself uh, uh, that gives a confirmation of the molecule also. Not only will get the free energy of binding, and uh, it will also tell where the molecule is actually. Is it uh, in the active site of the protein, or it is far away from the protein, or, or it is even far away from the protein? There is no, it is not there in the neighborhood of the protein. Okay, so, so studies are still going on uh, to find out uh, how it actually um, interacts with the uh, enzyme and how it uh, changes uh, the conformation of the catalytic site because all these inhibitors, whatever we have taken, is allosteric inhibitors which won't bind to the catalytic site of the RDRP. So we have to still find out uh, what is the mechanism, how. Uh, the allosteric inhibitors uh, changes the conformation of uh, uh, catalytic sites so that the enzyme become inhibited. So it can be used in the treatment of sars cov 2 So as I uh, move on to the conclusion, computer modeling techniques uh, contributes a major role in drug design optimization of new drug candidates. Apart from the conventional methods, it is talking in MDS, newer methods, such as metadynamics, and the sampling techniques, QMMM. Uh, etc. that is quantitative molecular uh, quantum mechanical molecular mechanics methods can be effectively utilized for the same purpose and uh, for the study we have chosen 12 different allosteric inhibitors and uh, that is studied using molecular docking and well tempered metadynamic simulations and the molecular docking studies show static overs that over are good inhibitors of palm 2 and palm 1 sites respectively and the well-tempered metadynamic studies reveal that the cover ABT and s are promising allosteric inhibitors. So the detailed analysis needs to be done to understand uh, how the drug actually modifies the catalytic site so that the enzyme will get inhibited. So this is uh, undergoing. And I would like to acknowledge the organizers of National Science State 2022 IPA Kerala State Branch Education Forum. And call workers, Dr. Pramod P.S., Dr. Raymond Kumar Singh, Dr. Subramanian Sapati, Dr. Sudhir Vidyam. And I should also thank for the competition facilities, that is Param Brahma, uh, National Super Conducting Mission Government of India. Thank you. Uh, at, uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. You are a very uh, because drug design process is one of the very vast area. This vast area, you are limited in a very short period of time and it explained in a very simple language, especially the various stages of drug design and uh, various uh, drug designs uh, and the role of role of med medicinal chemist using artificial intelligence like uh, structural based drug design and uh, ligand based drug design and molecular modeling. And, and the advancement of computational methods, especially with the molecular dynamic simulation and energy calculation with the quantum mechanics and the quantum uh, molecular mechanics. And also she explained uh, research works, especially with the COVID uh, research. And it was a really, it is an enriching and a brainstorming session. And it will be must, it might be helpful for our young minds to their dream to come true. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much on behalf of uh, IPA Kerala State Branch, our president and vice president and other officials. I once again we are exp we are expressing our sincere thanks and gratitude to you, madam, for being with us. And I am requesting the Limsi madam to present the uh, certificate of token of uh, <coughs> appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you, madam, for a good speech. Now, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Bobby Jones D, Professor of Pharmaceutics, St. Joseph College of Pharmacy, Chair Tiram, to introduce Mrs. Srija C. Nair for her experience regarding the recent trends. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Limsi, madam. Uh, I think I'm audible, right? Yes, sir, you're audible. Thank you. 
good morning all uh, all the respected uh, participants respected dignitaries senior professors and my dear students i am very happy to introduce uh, the second speaker of today's session uh, mrs Sri, srija c nair uh, actually she is uh, my friend only so i am very happy to introduce her mrs srija c nair is working as assistant professor amrita school of pharmacy she completed her bachelor's degree in pharmacy from the mgr medical university and her master's degree in pharmaceutics from amrita school of pharmacy amrita vishwavidyapitham kochi she submitted her phd thesis in faculty of medicine amrita vishwavidyapitham in uh, earlier in this month itself her doctoral dissertation was titled delivery of phenytoin sodium directly to the brain using nanolipid carriers as a treatment for acute epileptic seizure she worked as lecturer in lisi college of pharmacy from 2007 to 2010 she is also an experienced industrial professional with various uh, with experience in various pharmaceutical industries she has more than 12 years of teaching and almost 10 years of research experience and has more than 65 international publication to her credit she is the recipient of amrita innovation and research award era 2021 that is a publication merit award ms srija's current research focuses on nano carrier based brain drug delivery nose to brain delivery of nano therapeutics novel formulation approaches to reinvent drugs of potential therapeutic benefit etc since the time is uh, very short i am uh, not extending with these few words i cordially invite ms srija sinair for the talk on recent trends in intranasal drug delivery system over to you srija Okay good afternoon to all just a moment Good afternoon to all limsi madam can you able to see my slide Yes, yes, ma'am. You can continue. Is it changing? No, it's not changing. Please change the slide. I have changed it. Please go. Please go for the side slide show. Yes. Hope it is visible to you now. Yes, yes, it yes, is. Yes, yes. Now it's okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bobby, for the kind introduction. Uh, I am extremely happy to be a part of. Uh, this seminar session organized by indian pharmaceutical association edu in kerala state chapter education forum in connection with national science day 2022 congratulations to all those who have behind it and indeed it's a pleasant moment for me the title of my topic is uh, of my presentation is recent trends in drug delivery system in which i'll be discussing about the topic recent trends in intranasal drug delivery as we all know nasal route has been extensively used since long ago in ancient time the indian ayurvedic system of medicine used nasal route for the administration of drugs and this process is called as nasya karma and it has been widely used for treating a variety of ailments including cns disorders so in the last 10 years the interest in the intranasal drug delivery in pharmaceutical r&d has been increased and here comes the factors affecting the nasal drug absorption which include the physiochemical properties of the drug as well as its formulation as well as the physiological factors of the nasal mucosa and there are various strategies to enhance nasal drug absorption few i have mentioned in which i'll be focusing on novel drug delivery system mainly targeted nano drug delivery system <laughs> several studies have Uh, demonstrated a direct transport of drug through the olfactory region of the nasal mucosa to the cns in animal model without prior absorption into the blood where bbb is absent or thin in the brain olfactory interface upon insulation of drug into the nasal cavity there exists two pathway one through the trigeminal pathway that is in the anterior portion of the nasal cavity the other one is the 
olfactory epithelial pathway, which is in the posterior portion of the nasal cavity. So the former consists of rich in blood capillaries, making it an ideal site for systemic absorption of the drug, whereby the drug crosses the blood brain barrier and reaches into the brain. This is applicable in the case of conventional uh, nasal drug delivery, for example, nasal drops and all. And the second one is called olfactory epithelium, which offers a direct connection between the nose as well as the brain, which does not have an intact BBB. And this is particle size as well as lipophilicity mediated drug transport, which could be accomplished only by means of a targeted nano drug delivery system. So I'll be focusing on this area now. So through olfactory epithelium by extracellular perineural convection mediated bulk flow mechanism, the drug reaches into the CNS as well as olfactory bulb to reach into the brain directly. And I am going to discuss about the uh, disease condition called seizure emergency. A seizure emergency is a prolonged seizure or rapidly occurring seizure, which requires immediate medical attention. One such common type of seizure emergency is called status epilepticus. And IV benzodiazepines remains the first line therapeutic agent for this treatment. And IV, IV fentoin sodium remains the second line anti-epileptic drug for treating uh, acute epileptic seizure. Formulating drug into particulate nanocarriers, especially nanolipid carriers with smallest particle size and lipophilicity enables targeted drug deposition into the CSF as well as brain, so as to get a targeted drug mechanism of action. So NLC is a second generation SLN in which the lipid matrix consists of a specially blended mixture of solid lipid and liquid lipid. And it has a highly imperfect structure, which creates more space for the drug to remain inside the solid lipid matrix, which result in high entrapment efficiency, high drug loading efficiency, and uh, no expulsion of drug from the system during storage. So with this in intention, I have formulated fentoin sodium NLCs by melt emulsification followed by ultrasonication method using oleic acid as liquid lipid, cholesterol as solid lipid, and polyxomer as the surfactant. So I have prepared three different sized fentoin sodium NLC that is below 50 nanometer size, between 50 to 100 nanometer, and above 100 nanometer fentoin sodium NLC in order to study the effect of particle size on nose to brain olfactory delivery. And it was further characterized. And the TEM analysis, like you can see the TEM analysis data, we have shown that all the developed, all the three developed NLCs uh, particle size has, are in the desired a nano range which is suitable for intranasal application. Further, we have done the um, characterization study. The particle size and theta potential of the developed NLCs were uh, done by dynamic light scattering method. And among three different sized NLCs, the smaller size that is below 50 nanometer pentoin sodium NLC showed a smaller particle size of 32.59 nanometer uh, with the greatest or higher entrapment efficiency and drug loading. And after that, I have done the, in, the main in vitro studies, ex vivo permeation studies, then in, in vitro cell line studies using L929 cell and human brain capillary endothelial cell, then in vivo anticonvulsant activity study, as well as in vivo acute toxicity study also. So uh, due to time constraint, I'm not showing all these data, and I'm focusing on and one important study that is in vivo pharmacokinetic and biodistribution study, which was done in 200 Vista rats. So the study consists of total 200 rats were divided into uh, seven groups, consists of total 200 rats and based on the euthanasia time point, they are divided into five groups. So after treatment with formulation group based on the euthanasia, the animals were euthanized and the CSF was collected by cisterna magnapuncture method and bled by cardiac puncture method. Further, the organs were taken for biodistribution studies also. So this is the in vivo pharmacokinetics uh, data done in CSF. So the result of the in vivo pharmacokinetics study in CSF revealed a higher drug concentration for below 50 nanometer NLC formulation when compared to IV fentoin sodium as well as intranasal control drug solution, indicating the drug's availability in the CNS within short duration of time. 
Next is the in vivo pharmacokinetic study in plasma revealed that there is um, lower drug concentration of lower drug concentration for the below 50 nanometer NLCs when compared to IV fentoin sodium as well as intranasal control drug solution, indicating that there is minimal absorption of drug into the systemic circulation via intranasal olfactory route and further conf confirmed that nose to brain uh, direct delivery is not through systemic pathway but through a local pathway. So next is the brain biodistribution study. So this study is very important as the, as the brain is the target site of action. So the in vivo brain biodistribution studies revealed a higher drug concentration of drug for the below 50 nanometer NLCs as well as its spray formulation compared to the IV fentoin sodium as well as control drug solution, indicating direct nose to brain drug transport through olfactory epithelium, which is particle size as well as lip lipophilicity mediated transport. So the major observation from the in vivo biodistribution studies done in 200 Vista rats revealed that the below 50 nanometer fentoin sodium NLC formulation of 4 mg per kg dose achieved higher drug concentration in brain within five minutes of uh, intranasal administration. And the uh, obtained brain drug concentration is almost 50 times greater than the marketed IV formulation as well as the control drug solution. Next is the in vivo, in vivo nasal toxicity study was done to reveal the local toxicity of the developed formulation in comparison with the control mucosa. So the result of the study revealed that there is no histopathological changes noticed on the microscopic structure of olfactory mucosa as well as olfactory bulb upon formulation administration, indicating that the developed NLC formulation is safer for intranasal administration. So this is the schematic representation showing direct nose to brain delivery of fentoin below 50 nanometer fentoin sodium NLC through olfactory epithelium. So we hope that the research work will open a new window to deliver the anti-epileptic drug directly to the brain so as to minimize dose related side effect, adverse effect and dosing frequency for better control of epileptic seizure and also to provide a unique feature for enhanced brain delivery that could retain its name as the most prescribed drug in acute epileptic seizure. So we have published uh, the research work in, in pharmaceutics journal of impact factor 6.32. I would, I would like to acknowledge Amrita Vishwavidya Bedam for providing all the facilities and infrastructure. Thanks to DST Nano Mission for funding this project. And my sincere thanks goes to Dr. Shanti Kumar Vinaya, Dean Research, Amrita Center for Nano Science, whose valuable suggestion during the DRC meeting helped us a lot to complete this project. So coming to the recent advances in intranasal drug delivery. So in 2021, and this, this is the paper published in 2021, indicating the details of the number of annual publication and annual citation uh, in intranasal drug delivery area from the year 1998 to 2020. So you can see there is a drastic increase in the number of uh, publication, annual publication and, cite, and citation till 2020. And uh, Coming to the other advancement, like a lot of uh, researchers are working in this area to study the opportunistic and toxicological challenges during intranasal drug delivery, that is through intracellular approach, paracellular and transcellular mechanism, uh, you can deliver the drug directly to the brain. And this bar diagram gives the current status of approved drugs for nasal application. This is the clinical trial paper published at clinicaltrial.gov based on the age of the patients. And these papers explain that in addition to therapeutics, you can deliver biologics like insulin, DNA, and mRNA vaccine to the nasal, nasal and pulmonary mucosa for treating various disease. As you all know, chitosin is a widely acceptable biocompatible and biodegradable polymer that has a lot, uh, lo lot of application in drug delivery. And these papers explain the uh, various examples of chitosin loaded, chitosin drug loaded nanoparticles developed for intranasal administration and liposomal formulation for treating CNS disorders. 
And here comes the intranasal SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. These are under these studies are under clinical trial, and few papers explain the nasal prevention of SARS-CoV-2 infection by intranasal influenza-based boost vaccination in mouse model, and they got promising results. So from these results, it is inferred that intranasal route is a, it seems to be a promising route for the delivery of drugs as well as biological for tre treating various diseases, including CNS disorders. They can overcome the problems of conventional root drug formulation that includes avoidance of first pass metabolism, non-invasive approach, and uh, faster onset of action, and limited uh, systemic or peripheral side effects with more precise targeted action. And a lot of uh, research studies are going on this uh, these areas that is in related to intranasal drug delivery. You are in clinical trials and some are in pipeline. So this area needs to explore uh, further. So as a future ph pharmacist, you students can explore or utilize this area to explore further. Thank you all. This is the end of my presentation. Before concluding, I would like to thank the entire committee members of IPA, Kerala State Chapter Education Forum for inviting me for this webinar session. Thank you all. Then my heartfelt thanks and gratitude goes to my mentor and supporter, Dr. Sabitayam, Principal Amrita School of Pharmacy for her valuable suggestion and who provided me an opportunity to showcase my research areas or research talents in this prestigious platform. Once again, thank you all. Thank you, Srija, for that uh, wonderful as well as enlightening presentation. Actually, your topic is highly relevant today because, as we know, epilepsy is a, almost a non-curable condition which can affect the quality of life considerably. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and thank you for motivating the young pharmacists also. And uh, on behalf of uh, IPA Kerala State Branch, I would like to uh, thank you very much and I express my heartfelt uh, gratitude to you for uh, your presentation and for sparing your valuable time as well as energy uh, with us. Thank you very much and also I wish you all the best for your forthcoming PhD presentation. Thank, thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you. We'd like to present a digital certificate on behalf of IPA. Thank you. Dr. Lems, Lems, Lems. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Today, we have with us Dr. Kaladi, Professor and HOD of College of Pharmacy Sciences, Government Medical College, Alapura. I invite you, ma'am, to grace the occasion by your words. Respected dignitaries, colleagues, dear students, a warm good morning to one and all. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes, madam, you are audible. Okay, okay. IP Education Forum Kerala State Branch organizes different program for the budding pharma aspirants. Primary objective of today's program is to ignite an interest in science, inspire especially students, to perform new experiments and make them aware of the latest development in science and technology. Science is that tool that has given us the power to change the world. The occasion of National Science Day reminds us all the way science has contributed towards our life. Let us all travel together by providing hope and inspiration to future generations to pursue their goal. Wishing a very happy National Science Day to all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for, for your loving words. Now, I am delighted to invite Dr. Mohammad Hanifa, Principal, Maulana College of Pharmacy, Peridal Manna, for delivering a few words to facilitate the function. Sir, sir, please, over to you, sir. Hanifa, sir. Sir, uh, Anifa, sir, my microphone is muted. That's why.
Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Audible, sir. Okay. Uh, Uh, very uh, warm good afternoon to one and all, uh, respected uh, uh, dignitaries, speakers, office bearers of uh, IPA Kerala State Branch, faculty, student participants, and everyone present here. Uh, at the outset, let me thank IPA Kerala State Branch for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this program. As we all know, uh, National Science Day is celebrated in India on 28th February every year to commemorate the discovery of the Raman effect by Indian physicist, physicist Sir C. V. Raman on 28th February 1928. The main objective of uh, celebrating National Science Day is to propagate the importance of uh, science and its application among people. Uh, this celebration honors Sir C. V. Uh, Raman's exceptional contribution to research and discovery by providing hope and inspiration to future generations to pursue their dreams. National Science Day, it promotes uh, science and technology and its feasibility in our daily life. It also encourages scientists, writers, students, and others who are involved in the promotion of science and technology. I must appreciate the efforts of IPA Kerala State Branch under the active leadership of Dr. Jay Shekhar, Dr. John Joseph, and Dr. Krishna Omar, and all other office bearers of IPA to inculcate the research culture among students. Every scientist dreams of doing something that can help the world. A good scientist is a person with original ideas. On this great occasion, I wish and pray that all our students can come up in life with a good scientific temper. Hope this day will help to enhance their scientific zeal. Once again, I thank IPA for giving me this opportunity and I expect IPA will definitely continue to organize more such programs in future to educate, motivate and inspire our students. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir, for your inspirational words. All the participants are requested to fill the feedback form, which is posted in the chat box. Now, we are coming to the end of the program. Let's invite Dr. David Paul, Joint Secretary, IPA Kerala City Branch and Associate Professor, Department of Pharmacy Analysis, St. James College of Pharmacy Sciences, Chalakudi, to propose a vote of thanks. Madam, is it audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Respected dignitaries, members of Indian Pharmaceutical Association, chairs, conveners of each forum of Indian Pharmaceutical Association, Kerala State Branch, Principals of various pharmacy colleges, members of IPGA, KPGA, faculty members, and my dear, dear students, and all those who are gathered here online for today's National Science Day celebration 2022. A warm good afternoon to one and all. It's my privilege to propose a word of thanks on this auspicious occasion. First of all, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to God Almighty. I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to our honorable chief guest of today's function, Professor Shandri Kumar Nair, sir, uh, Dean Amrita Center of Nanoscience and Molecular Medicine, Amrita Vishya Vidya Vida, who accepted our invitation for inaugurating this event and spared time from his busy schedule to grace his occasion with this keynote address. Thank you for inspiring and encouraging us with your words on this special day. Thank you, sir. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to our president, Dr. P. Jayashagar, sir, who is a source of guiding light and motivation for us in successfully organizing the and delivering today and for delivering today's presidential address. Thank you, Jayashagar, sir. I must uh, mention our deep sense of appreciation for our uh, secretary, Dr. John Joseph, sir, uh, for his guidance, support, and thank you, John Joseph, sir. I must remark a professional sense of gratefulness to dynamic Dr. K. Krishnamal, sir, chair of educational division, 
and principal of St. James College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Chalukudi, for his Science Day message, guidance, and moral support. Thank you, sir. We are profoundly thankful to Dr. Wilby Diaz, Assistant Professor, College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Trivandrum, and Ms. Sreja C. Nair, Assistant Professor of Amrita School of Pharmacy, uh, both resource person for today's scientific session. And they deliver their area of expertise today in a clear cut way, which is which can which is motivational to our new young generation. Thank you, Dr. Vilby, Madam, and Dr. Sri, uh, Ms. Sri Nair, Madam. On behalf of IPA Kerala State Branch, I extend my gratitude to Dr. Sabida M. Principal, Amrita University, uh, and uh, Amrita Vishwavidya Pidam, Kochi. Dr. Arun Rashid, sir, Professor of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, Arishifa College of Pharmacy, Malapuram. Dr. Bobby John, sir, uh, Professor of Pharmaceutics, St. Joseph College of Pharmacy, Chartala, for introducing today's speaker, speakers and moderating today's scientific sanction. Thank you, Dr. Sabda, madam, Dr. Arun Rashid, sir, and Dr. Bobby, sir. I must thank Dr. Kala D. Professor and HOD of College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Government Medical College, Alapura and Dr. Mohamed Anifa, Principal, Maulana College of Pharmacy, Perindal Manna, for enlightening with motivational words. Thank you, Kala Madam and Mohamed Anifa, sir. I would like to express my gratitude to the principals of various pharmacy college of India, Kerala, members of IPGA, APGA, Office Bearers of Kerala Drugs Control Department, faculty members, student delegates, who all attended today's online event for their present and contribution uh, to making this webinar a great success. Thank you. I am further thankful for entire organizing team, especially Dr. Lim Sambi, Madam, for putting for this idea of commemorating National Science Day and for anchoring today's event. Thank you, Madam. On behalf of IPA Kerala State Educational Division and myself, David Paul, thank you everyone once again for making today's event a great success. Have a great day ahead. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. Let us wind up the session with the national anthem. Let's all rise for the national anthem. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>